This is the iPhone 14 Pro. It's been out for a while and there are already a lot of reviews about it. And although it's not much of a design change from the iPhone 13 Pro, there are some important hardware changes that might make upgrading a little bit less intuitive than it's been in the past. And that's because the iPhone 14 Pro and the iPhone 14 have gotten rid of the physical SIM card tray and they've gone completely eSIM. Now, that's just right now for the US editions, but you can be sure that's going to be coming to international versions in the not too distant future. So this is my iPhone 14 Pro review and we're going to have to talk about eSIMs. Hi everybody, Fox Nomad here and today I want to help you travel smarter with my review of the iPhone 14 Pro and everything you need to know about eSIMs and what it's like to transfer from an older phone to this new completely eSIM version. As far as iPhone updates go, the iPhone 14 Pro is a refinement on what worked in the iPhone 13. The unboxing experience is that familiar, thin, nearly all paper box that doesn't include a charging brick because environment and cost, but environment too. This is the iPhone 14 Pro in the deep purple color, new to this year's lineup, but there's also a space black, gold, and silver to choose from. As it's been for a while in the Pro line, the back of the phone has a matte finish, while the edges are a glossy metal, the opposite of the iPhone 14, which has the glossy and the matte parts reversed. The iPhone 14 Pro also has a glossy finish on the camera bump, not matte like the regular iPhone 14. And speaking of that camera bump, it is beefy. Now, camera bumps aren't anything new on iPhones or phones in general these days, but even with the case, the iPhone 14 Pro will rock a little bit on a flat desk. The thickness of the camera bump, if you use a phone case like I'm sure most of you do, will make it a little harder to line up the phone to charge on a smaller wireless charger. You might have to adjust it a bit or a few times until it sits just right to get a consistent charge. Now, until you see it in person, it's really hard to get an idea of just how thick that camera bump is. But behind that massive camera bump is a 48 megapixel sensor for the main lens, and then you've got your ultra wide lens and a telephoto lens also. The 48 megapixel sensor is a big leap for the iPhone Pro line, which up until this point had been using a 12 megapixel sensor for the last several years. This new sensor means the camera can pick up more details, which remain sharper when you want to zoom in or blow up a certain part of the image. But to get the full use of the 48 megapixel sensor, you'll have to use Apple's ProRAW format, which you can enable through the phone settings. I'm guessing that Apple doesn't enable ProRAW by default because at 75 megabytes, those pictures are really going to start to take up a lot of space on your phone's storage. And RAW photos are meant to be edited later after the fact, hence the RAW name. So it's a feature you probably won't be using unless you're a photographer type, someone who edits your photos after the fact, and you have plenty of storage space on your phone. But the photos out of the camera in ProRAW have exceptional detail. You can see that when I zoom in here to some photos taken at 48 megapixels in ProRAW. Here's the pictures side by side as well, one straight out of the camera on the left, the other one edited with some color and contrast applied on the right. And the front facing camera now has autofocus, so you can if I click my hand here, focus on that, focus on my face, which gives you a little bit more flexibility on what you can do with the front facing camera and yes, give you better selfies as well. And if you were wondering about what the microphone is like, you're listening to it straight out of the phone right now. I will note though, because of the placement of the front facing camera here on the display, that makes it harder to block. If you're one of those people who has a cover over your current phone's cameras for privacy concerns, that's more difficult to do on the iPhone 14 Pro and any camera cover you do place there is going to block a portion of the screen around it. The iPhone 14 can also shoot in ProRes, which is akin to ProRAW for photos. ProRes is a video format with much less compression that gives you a higher video quality meant for a production workflow, which is a fancy way of saying you'll probably be editing clips in software like Final Cut Pro. Now on the 128 gigabyte models of the iPhone 14 Pro, you are limited to shooting in 1080p 30 FPS. And for the 256 gigabyte model and above, you can shoot in ProRes at 4K. Now shooting ProRes videos is probably something all of you aren't going to want to do all the time because at six gigabytes per minute of video at 4K, that's going to fill up your phone storage pretty fast. But if you want the highest possible quality videos, you can do that with the iPhone 14 Pro. Physically, there are a few other additions to the iPhone 14 Pro. So let's talk about what Apple is calling the dynamic island. 
see the notch is gone and the camera and face sensors are now at the top in the display. The speaker grill isn't there. It's actually at the top right here in this very thin cutout that you can almost barely see. But moving the face ID and sensors into the camera display gives you some more screen real estate and isn't all that noticeable in day to day use. And Apple being Apple is taking that one step further, making that little pill cutout on the top, not only just something to notice, but a feature, a feature that's called Dynamic Island. So for example, when you're charging your phone, you'll get this animation across the top. But probably the most useful function I found for the Dynamic Island is when listening to media like podcasts, not only does this animation look very satisfying seeing that waveform up there, but if you press and hold it, you'll be taken to a little mini media player. Now, if you tap on the Dynamic Island, you'll get taken into the podcast app, for example, which is a little bit confusing and less intuitive than a tap to open the little media player, which would be nice, rather than a long press, which it is currently set up to be. I'd rather reverse those two functions so that when you long press, you go into like the podcast app, and when you tap it, you go into the mini media player. Another big ish change to the iPhone 14 Pro is the always on display, which is pretty much what it sounds like. The display remains on even when you're not using the phone. So when it's like sitting on your desk, for example, and it takes advantage of the OLED screen that's here, it drops the refresh rate down to one hertz, dims the screen a little bit, and uh, you always have an always on display. In my testing, it ended up causing about 10 to 15% more battery drain over an entire day but I ended up disabling it mainly because it kept making me look at my phone. It always felt like there was a notification waiting with the screen being lit, but your preference might vary. It's pretty smart though and won't keep the display on when it's in your pocket, for example, or when it's in sleep mode, or when it's at an angle where it doesn't think that you're actually looking at the screen. A few other changes to note, there's also crash detection in the iPhone 14 Pro, which will automatically notify your emergency contacts if you're on a roller coaster, I mean, in a car crash, and SOS satellite connectivity. Crash detection works by using the sensors in the phone to recognize when you've come to a very sudden stop in circumstances that would indicate you've been in a crash or on a roller coaster. Hopefully, Apple works that one out. The other feature, satellite connectivity, lets you make phone calls when you're outside of the range of cell towers. Say you're driving somewhere remote and you get a flat tire. You don't have any cell bars on your phone, but you'll now on the iPhone 14 Pro see an SOS symbol, meaning you can make calls because the phone has a satellite connection, assuming you have a clear view of the sky. That's a feature I think low-key has the potential to become very useful and has so far been somewhat underrated. But the biggest hardware change in the iPhone 14 Pro and the iPhone 14s in general is that they don't come with a physical SIM card tray anymore, at least for the version sold in the US for now. And that, for a lot of you who are going to be upgrading to these phones or traveling internationally with one of these phones, that is going to be a major change. The SIM card, this little thing you're probably familiar with, stands for Subscriber Identity Module and is a thin piece of plastic with a gold plate on it. You're probably familiar with these and have swapped one, two, or 50 out in your lifetime. SIM cards contain data like the International Mobile Subscriber Identity, IMSI number, which is used to identify your phone on a mobile network. In short, the information on a SIM card tells a mobile network whether or not your phone can use it. In most places, there are cell towers all around you with lots of mobile providers and they need a way to know if your phone is allowed on their network. The identity of your phone is also tied to your phone plan, how much data and texting and talk time you've paid for, all of that. With physical SIM cards, if you're using AT&T and want to switch to T-Mobile, for example, you would simply replace the physical SIM card in your phone, which would then give you another ID to use on another network. And the same thing applies for international travel, going to Denmark or Thailand. If you want to use your phone there without paying international roaming, you'd get a local SIM card. Now for all of this SIM swapping to work, your phone has to be unlocked, which in most cases means that it's already been paid off. So if you're paying your phone monthly, typically until it's fully paid off, the carrier is going to lock your phone. So you won't be able to use other SIM cards from other networks. In the US, SIM cards weren't even standard on most phones until the early 2010s, whereas in the rest of the world, they were pretty common. That meant if you were traveling internationally and your phone didn't have a SIM card that you could remove, you couldn't just swap it out for a local mobile provider. 
And that is one major advantage of having SIM cards. Instead of hard coding all that identity information on the phone itself, it is then embedded in those SIM cards. So if you want to change the identity of your phone, at least change the carrier of your phone, you can easily do that. What changed in 2016, what's known as the Universal Integrated Circuit Card or UUIC on the SIM card was standardized into the eSIM, which uses an eUUIC chip hardwired on newer phones. Most newer phones like the iPhone 11, 12, 13, and yes, the iPhone 14 and 14 Pro all support eSIM as do a bunch of other Android devices. But the iPhone 14 line are the first from Apple at least to go completely eSIM. eSIMs are basically the digitized version of those physical SIM cards and have now been integrated into newer smartphones. Some of the benefits of eSIM are that you can load multiple eSIMs at the same time. Before, that required physical dual SIM card slots, but now say you're traveling within the US. Your mobile provider, let's say Mint, doesn't have good coverage in Nebraska. So you can simply load up, for example, an AT&T or Verizon eSIM to ensure you have coverage. E-SIMs are more flexible, they save you time, and are pretty much better in every way than physical SIM cards. But the transition to e-SIMs can be a little bit confusing, and the process of transferring from an older iPhone to a newer iPhone with e-SIMs isn't always the smoothest. So let me break down what you need to know before transferring to an iPhone 14 or iPhone 14 Pro that's completely e-SIM from an older phone. Transferring from an old iPhone to an iPhone 14 or 14 Pro is much like it's always been. Enable Bluetooth on both phones, keep them close together, and follow the steps on the screen. You'll be asked to enter your Apple ID, and a few taps later, your old phone will begin transferring everything over to the new one. In theory, in theory, your old SIM card, whether it's physical or an eSIM, should transfer over seamlessly to the new phone but it doesn't always work like that. When your transfer from your old iPhone to the newer one completes, it will ask you if you want to wipe your old phone completely or wipe it except for the eSIM. This is an important point. Don't wipe your phone at all, just yet. Put your old iPhone in airplane mode and ensure that the eSIM on your new phone is installed and working properly, that you can make calls with it, send texts, and that the data is working. Once you've ensured that your eSIM is working properly and that all of your data has transferred over, and if you have any multi-factor accounts or codes on your phone, make sure that you transfer those over too. Those don't always transfer over and can make it difficult to get back into your accounts from your new phone. So just a pro tip, make sure that those transfer over as well. Once you made sure that all of that is working, your eSIM, the data, and any other you know, applications or information, all your photos, everything, especially the eSIM though, once you made sure that that has transferred all over successfully, then you can go back into your old iPhone, disable it from your Apple ID, you know, decouple it from the Apple ecosystem, and then wipe the old phone. I say that because this is not only best practice to make sure that you have a backup and that everything is transferred over, but because I have seen from a lot of people and had this experience myself, the transfer from the old phone to the new phone to eSIM doesn't always work. And if it doesn't work and you've deleted your old phone and you wipe the eSIM out of it, then you're going to have to call the phone company, your mobile provider, go online, authenticate yourself. It is a major, major hassle to then try to get the old eSIM onto your new phone, to get them to send you a new eSIM code that you can install on your new phone. It is a lot more cumbersome. It is a lot more steps. There's a lot more of your time that you don't want to be having to use. Oh, and if you need to prove who you are, a lot of phone companies will send you a text message with a code. But if you don't have the eSIM working and you've deleted the old phone, you won't be able to get into that account. You won't be able to use that verification code, which means you have to call or go to a store and it's just more and more hassle. So you can see why I'm really strongly advising you to just make sure that the eSIM transfers over properly. In case you notice that the eSIM transfer hasn't worked properly, you can initiate it again from your new iPhone. From the settings, you can transfer a physical SIM over to an eSIM on your new phone or do an eSIM to eSIM transfer. Again, in theory, it should all work properly, but don't count on it. Make sure that everything is transferred and working properly before you delete your old phone. Now, I know I've spent a lot of time talking about eSIMs in this iPhone 14 Pro review. 
but it's a big change that many of you might not be expecting and it's a concept you might not be familiar with. Some have compared it to Apple removing the headphone jack, but that's a piece of hardware that still has some actual use and pretty much all of us have gotten used to wireless earbuds and their adapters if we need them. But eSIMs are a real improvement over physical SIM cards. The only pain point I can foresee in the immediate future is if you're traveling internationally, some local providers might not have a robust eSIM infrastructure. You know, in some cases where it might have been just easier to swap out a SIM card to a local provider in Thailand or Turkey or South Africa or wherever, you won't be able to do that with the iPhone 14 Pro or the iPhone 14. But as Apple and the iPhone goes, so does the industry. So carriers that don't have a robust eSIM infrastructure, if they carry the iPhone 14 or the iPhone 14 Pro, you can better believe that they're gonna be beefing that up really fast. And for everybody else, it's just a push to go completely eSIM and to support eSIMs. And even when you're traveling internationally, there are a bunch of eSIM providers. There are apps you can just download on your phone where you can just load eSIMs for all countries pretty much around the world. So it's not too much of a hindrance, but it just might be a little bit of a rough transition, especially if you're somebody who's used to swapping out SIM cards when you travel regularly. I've made other videos about eSIMs, so if you still have questions, I'll link to those in the description below. But hopefully this review gets you prepared for the iPhone 14 Pro and also gets you prepared for the future, the world of eSIM only. Thanks very much for watching this review. Let me know if you have any questions down in the comments below. And while you're down there, hit the like and subscribe buttons. I'll have new videos for you every week. And I'll see you in the next video.